uh, our vision research here. Mm -hmm. And today uh, we have one before last uh, presentation. And so next week will be our final for the season six. And we will start in September uh, 13 uh, with uh, Dr. DiPolo. Uh, that again will be a little bit of break. So to do uh, some outstanding research and hopefully to see you all uh, joining us. Um, but before we get to September, today we have uh, a fantastic speaker and uh, scientist, uh, perhaps the best structural biologist in our field, and not only, as you will see today, but uh, who is not better than his student introducing our speaker today. Hello everyone, good morning, happy Friday. My name is Yasmin Solano. I'm a PhD candidate in Dr. Philip Kaiser's lab. Today is my pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Philip Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser is currently an associate professor in the departments of physiology and biophysics, ophthalmology, and clinical pharmacy practice here at University of California, Irvine, as well as um, a research health scientist at the Tibor Rubin Long Beach VA Medical Center. His research is focused on uncovering the fundamental biochemistry and physiology of the first step of vision, as well as developing novel therapeutics for the treatment of retinal diseases. Dr. Kaiser has been a author on over 80 published papers, and over the past six years, he has served as a grant reviewer for eight different organizations. He is currently a standing member of the editorial board of the Journal of Biological Chemistry, and he has served as an advisor or co-advisor to six individuals who now hold high positions in industry along with uh, professor posi positions today. His laboratory is funded by the National Eye Institute and the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, the National Science Foundation, and the Research to Prevent Blindness Career Advancement um, Award. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Philip Kaiser for today's Distinguished Speaker Seminar Talk. Okay. Thank you, Yasmin, for that kind introduction. Thank you to Grajna and Chris for the invitation to speak today. Um, what I'd like to tell you about is a story that actually started telling you about two years ago, the last time I spoke in the seminar series um, about a protein called cellular retinaldehyde binding protein. Um, and this is a, a study that we recently got published in Cell Reports uh, about a month ago. So I thought it would be a good time to present it and also maybe elaborate a little bit on some things that I wasn't able to discuss in the paper due to space limitations. And so this um, presentation is going to be about this protein, cellular retinaldehyde binding protein, or CRALVP, which is uh, a protein of, of, of importance for our visual function, for, for vision, but it's still really um, enigmatic in many ways, um, as I'll discuss through this um, talk. And so there's, I think, still a lot to learn about this protein. So I'll just, for the benefit of students and um, just to kind of orient us, um, last week, Dr. Um, Horton gave us a really nice talk about um, <clears throat> intermittent exotropia, where he had focused a lot on what's happening in the visual field and the visual cortex, where the visual signal becomes a part of our consciousness, and how that how that signal can feed back to control the extraocular muscles via the cranial nerves. And so, in this talk, and I, I would highly recommend if you didn't see that last week to go back and look at that um, that talk. It was really nice. But today, I'm going to bring us to the front of this system. Um, back to the eye, and we're going to be zooming in and focusing on the, the the posterior part of the eye, which is the retina, and that's where the visual signal is first detected. Um, if we zoom in further, we know in the retina there's a number of um, neuron layers here, and where the light signal is actually um, first sensed is within these photoreceptor cells that are in close contact with a cell layer called the retinal pigment epithelium. We zoom in even further and look at the outer segments of those photoreceptors. Um, we know that there are proteins there called visual pigments, which are the light sensors of the retina. And they contain this molecule 11 cis retinal, which is um, really a linchpin molecule in this system. If you don't have 11 cis retinal, you're blind. So it's really important to control this molecule. Um, the way these visual pigments work, whenever there's a photon that impinges upon the retina, that photon is absorbed by this 11 cis retinal molecule. And when it does so, it, that molecule undergoes a photoisomerization from 
11 cysts to all trans. And when it does so, it leads to these conformational changes in this opsin protein that allow the protein to couple to G proteins and initiate phototransduction. So this is really the first event of vision where a photon, a light signal is converted to an electrical, electrochemical signal within a neuron. And so as I've shown here at the very end of this process, um, this is not a mistake, the, the, the receptor actually loses its chromophore, it gets hydrolyzed away. And there needs to be a mechanism to convert this trans retinoid back to a cis retinoid. And that's accomplished through this um, well-known pathway called the visual cycle, um, that it really involves two cells. Um, so this is the process I just showed you where this 11 cis retinoid is being converted to an all trans retinoid by light. That's what initiates the signal. And this all trans retinoid needs to be processed back to the 11 cis form. And conceptually, that could be very easy. You could say that you might think there's just a system that converts it from trans to cis, but it's not so easy. It actually involves a lot of steps. This has to be first reduced to all trans retinol. And then this retinol is shuttled to the retinal pigment epithelium layer where it's esterified by LRAT. And I want you to take a special note of this reaction um, where this all trans retinal ester is being converted back to an 11 cis retinoid, 11 cis retinol by, R, by RV65. And this is the hallmark step of the visual cycle where you have a trans retinoid going back to a cis retinoid. So this 11 cis retinol is then oxidized by RDH5 to produce our, to regenerate the visual chromophore 11 cis retinol. And kind of the terminal acceptor of this, of this 11 cis retinol is, a prote is the protein CRLVP, which I'll be talking about. Here. So this is shuttled back to the photoreceptor to regenerate opsin, and this, in effect, then allows vision to be continuous. So you, you're bleaching opsins, you get regeneration of the visual chromophore, and it recharges the, the visual opsin so you can keep seeing. So it's a very important pathway, and of course mutations in several of these proteins are involved in retinal diseases. And so we now know that um, actually that's a, a simplistic view of how 11 cis retinol is formed, um, it's, there's actually been a, several other pathways that have been discovered, <coughs> um, some, some in, um, occurring within the photoreceptor outer segments themselves, and other pathways that are present within um, another cell layer called, a, called the, um, the Muir glia, um, where you can see there's processes, for example, involving um, RGR, um, retinal um, G protein coupled receptor, which is a photoisomerase that can convert all trans retinol back to 11 cis retinol. And this is work from um, Fong, the Fong lab many years ago, as well as um, the Travis lab and the Palczewski lab, showing that RGR is relevant for this process, both, both in the muorglia as well as in the, in the retinal pigment epithelium. Um, but the point that I want to make in this, um, in this slide is that a commonality between, I think, all, most or all of these pathways is the involvement of this protein CRLVP. Um, and it is indeed expressed in not just the retinal pigment epithelium as I was showing you, but it's also expressed within the Muir glia. So this is kind of um, long been of interest why it's present in these two cells and why um, what, their, what their functional um, roles are. So if we, let me kind of introduce you a little bit to, to, to cellular retinaldehyde binding protein. I have the crystal structure shown here, which was determined in Occam Stoker's lab um, a few years ago. Um, so this is the protein, it's encoded by the RALBP1 gene. So you may hear me call this protein RALBP1 during the talk. Um, it's a member of the Krautrio superfamily. And importantly, it stereo specifically binds 11 cis retinoids. Um, it also binds nine cis, but this is probably not physiologically relevant. And so the function of this protein, um, so it's protecting these bound retinoids from isomerization and off pathway reactions. And you can see how that occurs from this crystal structure. Here's the um, 11 cis retinol bound in the, in the pocket. And you can see it's very tightly um, enclosed by this pocket and it's completely isolated from the bulk solvent. And so this protects this retinoid from off pathway reactions and also prevents premature photoisomerization. Um, <clears throat> it's actually kind of a mystery how this, how this ligand gets released. We know it's, it binds here, but as far as what, how it actually gets released from the protein, something that um, still requires some, some additional research. So again, like I said, pointed out, it's expressed both in the retinal pigment epithelium as well as the, the Muir glia. And this is a protein that's involved in retinal diseases. So um, we know that RALVP1 loss of function mutations in humans are associated with a variety of, of retinal diseases like retinitis punctata um, albicans, 
um, botany dystrophy, fundus nalvi punctatus, et cetera. And if you look at the phenotypes associated with those diseases, these are ERGs from two um, affected patients. They have biallelic loss of function mutations in Robbie P1 um, compared to a normal individual. So what you can tell immediately is that this is an ERG recording. And if you um, only allow these patients to dark adapt for 30 minutes prior to the ERG, their, their, ERG, their ERGs are flat, um, whereas a normal person has, has a, a clear response. <laughs> So they have a problem with dark adaptation, although this dark adaptation process is not blocked. So this is a um, case where they allow the patient to dark adapt for overnight and then record the ERG and you can see that it does come back. So this is saying that CRVP is not absolutely important for um, the recovery of, of visual function, but it certainly is, is important for the kinetics of that process. Okay, and then structurally, you can see a variety of different defects in these fundus images. There's these sort of white puncta that are present in a lot of patients. There's some pigmentary changes and there's some degeneration that can be appreciated in, in, these, in, these, um, in these images. So it's both a functional defect as well as a sort of can, can be a progressive structural um, pathology that can occur in these patients as well. Okay, um, going back one, one thing I forgot to mention here. So, because, the, because of this disease association, um, there's efforts to design gene therapies to treat these conditions, to treat these different conditions associated with Robbie P1 loss of function mutations. And I, that's an important point that I'll come back to later because I think our work kind of speaks to um, the targeting that, that should be prioritized for those gene therapies. So to kind of get at the physiology of CRVP, there were um, global knockout sorry, global knockout mice made um, back in 2001 by Jack Sari's group. Um, and they made these to investigate the physiology as well as the pathophysiology of CRVP. And what they found um, was that these mice recapitulated the ERG um, recovery defect that was found in humans. This is a wild type mouse where you have dark adapted bleached and you can see the ERG recover over time. Whereas in the knockout mouse, um, the dark adapted ERG is normal, but after a bleach, it doesn't really recover over this period of time. So there's a, a major delay in dark adaptation. Um, there, one thing that wasn't recapitulated was, was the um, retinal degeneration. They didn't find retinal degeneration where the mice were housed under normal light. However, what they did find was that um, CRVP loss of function actually protects against light-induced retinal degeneration. And this is probably could be attributed to the fact that it's slowing down the visual cycle. You know, there's a, a link between visual cycle activity and light damage susceptibility. And then taking this further, this is work from Vladimir Kefalov's lab. They also showed that there's a slowing in the rate of cone recovery after a bleach as well. This was mainly um, reflecting rod recovery. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, those studies kind of nicely um, confirm that CRVP is important for the physiology of vision and, and the retina, um, important for retinal structure and function. But one thing that they didn't address was the relative importance of the pools of CRVP in the, in the retinal pigment epithelium versus the Muir glia, um, both in supporting rod and cone function. So there were follow-up studies to this. Um, we're, we're not the first to wonder about this question. There's been quite a few studies that have been performed in the past. Um, one group of studies focused on zebrafish. So the zebrafish are a, a nice model to study this question because in the larval phase in particular, they have a, um, they have a cone dominant retina. So you can really nicely assess cone function. And another important characteristic of the zebrafish is that they actually have two Robbie P1 genes due to a whole genome duplication that occurred. And those came to be differentially expressed in the Muir glia and the RPE. So what that enables then are, are, are you know, kind of an easy way to selectively target those two cell types, either by morpholine and knockdown or um, by gene knockouts. And so the, the first studies, which were published several years ago now, back in like 2007, 2008, um, used morpholino knockdowns and kind of came to the conclusion that both pools are important for function. Both the Mueller glia and the RPE are important for cone function. Um, there was a more recent study that was published by the um, by Stefan Newhouse's lab um, in collaboration with Johannes von Lentig, where they actually used knockout um, zebrafish for these studies. And they got a different result where they found the pool within the RPE is actually the more important pool. Um, they didn't find 
much impact of the Muir Glia pool on cone function. So that's zebrafish. This has also been investigated in, um, in mice. Um, this is work from Vladimir Kefalov's lab where they had taken global RALVP1 knockout mice and then reintroduced expression of CRLVP with AAV viruses. And this work um, played, um, came, um, <clears throat> this work supported a, an important role for the CRLVP within the Muir glia um, in, in supporting um, cone function. And, the, and there was some follow-up work here um, that we did in collaboration with, with Vladimir's lab um, where we were able to show <clears throat> that the level of of CRLVP and Muir glia um, um, controls function of the of the M cones, um, particularly whenever the classical visual cycle is suppressed. Okay, so there was there's a little bit of kind of not a clear um, unified vision of the of the roles of these two protein pools in cone and rod function from these studies, and so we wanted to kind of further look into this. Um, through a different approach. And we actually used an approach that was suggested by um, the Sari lab whenever they published their kind of the seminal neuron paper in 2001. It's kind of at the end of the paper. They, they suggest that perhaps the contribution of these two cell types in um, to the phenotypes could be dissected by cell um, selective inactivation of the gene in the wild type mice. So that's kind of the approach that we took. And this we wanted to actually <clears throat> use this approach um, and knock out the gene in developmentally mature mice so that we could eliminate any, de any developmental effects that might arise from knocking RALVP1 out from during the developmental process. Okay. So this actually should be fairly straightforward. I mean, there's technologies that enable to do this, like the Cree locks piece system, but one, um, one, um, <clears throat> kind of limitation that held back these studies was the absence of a really robust um, mouse line that enabled uniform Cree expression within the retinal pigment epithelium. Most of the lines um, work pretty well, but you still have some residual kind of mosaic expression of Cree. And uh, we kind of made an advance in this area a couple of years ago where we were able to design a new mouse line that expresses Cree under the native RP65 um, locus. And what we found, um, and I have that, that kind of um, um, construct design shown here. So what this is doing, is actually um, a, a 2A fusion between RP65 and Cree ERT2. And whenever this is produced, it actually makes two separate polypeptides. And of course, RP65 is a very um, RP specific gene. So what we found is um, whether we induced with tamoxifen, uh, sorry, this is a tamoxifen inducible Cree as well, it's Cree ER. So whether we induced a P40 or P69, you can see we had this really nice conversion of this reporter from red to green, which occurred in virtually every RPE cell. And it was very dependent upon um, the presence of tamoxifen. So in the no tamoxifen control, we saw no conversion. And this cross section shows that the conversion was very specific to the retinal pigment epithelium. So with this line in hand, we were really in a, in a good position to address this question to do both, to do the knockout, both in the Mueller glia and the RPE. So the way um, we designed this system, again, we did it, we were relying on the three um, LOXP system. We put LOXP sites surrounding exon six of the RALVP1 gene. And whenever that's excised, it results in a non-functional um, a non-functional allele. And so we cross these lines with either the RP65 Cree line that I just discussed or the glass Cree line that was developed several years ago by Jeff, Jeremy Nathan's lab, um, which is again also tamoxifen inducible. And this will allow us to abolish CRLVP expression in the RPE or the Muir glia cells upon tamoxifen treatment. So we made these lines and we also generated them both on a GNAP wild type background as, as well as a GNAP one minus minus background. Just to remind you, GNAP one is the alpha subunit of transducin. So that's the G protein that interacts with rhodopsin um, to carry the signal on. And so if you knock that out, rod function is abolished, rod signaling is abolished. And so that allows you to look specifically at cones. That's a um, important tool because um, 
cones are, of course, a, min a very small minority of the photoreceptors in the mouse retina. So it's important to have a tool to be able to selectively look at those, and that enables us to do that. Okay. So just to go through how we induce these mice, we either let them rest for either, basically we, we induce the mice either at P21 in the case of the, um, of the glass free lines or at P30 in the case of the RPE65 free lines. Um, we did this either with tamoxifen IP or tamoxifen in the chow. Um, just a point, either one worked well for the RPE65 um, free line, but for the glass free, um, we found that it worked far better to deliver the, the drug in the chow over a longer period of time. That gave us a much better knockout efficiency. So we allowed, we did our um, induction and then we allowed the animals to age out to P90 um, to do experiments. And this was allowed to allow any residual CRLBP to be degraded um, from, from, the, from the cells. Okay, so the first thing that I need to um, convince you of is that we're able actually to achieve what we're trying to do, which is to have good, complete cell-specific knockout. So uh, we did we evaluated this by a couple of different ways, and I'll show you IHC data first. So we're looking at the the RP65 um, Cre lines here. This is the vehicle um, section. This is the tamoxifen treated section. And this is the RPE layer and the ganglion cell layer. And so you can see a nice um, layer, a, a nice um, CRVP signal, which is in red throughout the RPE here. By the way, the blue is DAPI staining the cellular nuclei. Um, but in the tamoxifen treated animals, this signal is gone, although it's still present within the neural retina. So we can zoom in on um, one of these areas and kind of see this more clearly where it's clearly present within the RPE and the vehicle treated mice, whereas in the tamoxifen treated mice, it is um, completely gone. And this is just uh, getting rid of the bright field image to let you see that very clearly. Okay, So that looks promising. And then um, these are the corresponding data for the Mueller cell knockouts using the glass pre line. Again, in the vehicle treated animals, we see nice layer in the um, nice signal in the RPE as well as the neural retina. Uh, but once we treat with tamoxifen, you see this signal mostly go away within the neural retina. <clears throat> I, I point out a few places where we have Mueller glia that still express CRVP. So again, this wasn't um, as complete as with the um, RPE knockout, but it was still um, very, very um, high efficiency knockout. And you can see most of those positive um, Mueller glia are, are out in the periphery of the retina. Again, zooming in, you can see this clearly. Um, vehicle treated mice, tamoxifen treated mice, you see the signals gone from the, from the inner retina. Okay. So we also evaluated this by Western blotting. <clears throat> um, these are, each one of these lanes corresponds to, <clears throat> to an eye from an individual an animal. So we looked at many of these. Um, again, looking at the RP knockouts first, if we look at the tamoxifen treated animals, we see the signals gone, almost completely 100% gone in those animals. <clears throat> um, where it's present in the controls. So again, confirming that we have, you know, probably 99 at least percent knockout efficiency in these animals. Um, we also then, so these are separated, we're looking at the eye cups, which contain the RPE. And we also looked at the neural retina to see if we're, if there's any compensation happening. You could imagine possibly if we would knock out CRBP in the RPE, there may be some compensation that could happen where it might upregulate, for example, in the neural retina. But in fact, we really don't see that. Um, although this is a, turned out to be significant, uh, significant difference between these two groups. It's you know quantitatively, it's um, not not meaning not a meaningful difference between those two. So we don't really see any um, regulatory changes there. Okay. So now looking at the Mueller glia knockout, here are the isolated eye cups. Here are the isolated neural retina, and you can see here that. Um, we have eliminated um, a, a great majority of the CRVP signal from most of these animals. You know, we have cases where it's essentially 100% complete knockout, others where it's maybe 85 to 90% knockout efficiency. <clears throat> but the important thing is we're able to use Western blotting to um, evaluate this. And in some of the experiments I'll show you later, we, we would always do Western blotting afterwards so that we could select animals for analysis where we could confirm that we had a, you know, at least 95 or greater percent knockout efficiency um, in the retina. <clears throat> Again, no compensatory changes within the RPE were detected. 
Okay. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you that we can knock this protein out in a cell specific manner. <clears throat> and now we wanted to just sort of do a, a, a baseline characterization of these mice. Um, again, these were three months of age. Um, we wanted to first look at the retinal structure by OCT. Um, these are the different lines. We have the RPE um, knockouts versus controls on um, a gene out wild type background and the same thing on a gene out knockout background. And I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but just to say that the retinal structure was not different between any of these groups. And we didn't see any loss of the um, outer nuclear layer, which are the cell bodies of the photoreceptor. So that's good. We didn't see any de degenerative changes. <clears throat> and that was expected because, again, in the global knockout alliance, there was also no degenerative changes noted. So that's completely expected. And basically, it's the same story for the Muraglia knockouts. There were no differences between the groups. Everything looked normal. And so that was really good news because, again, we weren't really wanting to study pathology. We were wanting to study physiology with these mouse lines. So that was um, a, a really good finding. Um, <clears throat> then we also next looked at the dark adapted rod driven ERGs <clears throat> um, <clears throat> in the cell specific knockout lines. And again, this is just looking at um, after the this, this system has had time to fully regenerate. So we're again, more or less looking at if there's any baseline defects in these animals. Um, looking at the RP knockouts compared to the controls, A wave amplitudes, B wave amplitudes, there's no significant difference um, between these two groups. And it's the same story for the Muraglia knockouts. <coughs> no significant differences between the ERG responses in those groups. So again, confirming that even though there may be a defect in the visual cycle, if you give the, the um, animals enough time to dark adapt, their ERGs can come back and, and be recorded as normal. So this is kind of where the first interesting finding um, shows up, where we're here now we're looking at gene at one minus minus mice. So these are mice where we're actually looking specifically at the cone responses. And what you can see is in the RPE knockouts compared to the control mice, there's this shift in the sensitivity where the, the knockouts are less sensitive compared to their control um, <clears throat> counterparts. This was a statistically significant difference in the I one half values that were obtained by fitting to, this, to the knockout Rushton equation. So there's um, some background desensitization of the cones that was observed in this RPE knockout line. However, we didn't see the same thing in the Muir glia knockout line. There were no significant difference between those, <clears throat> those I one half values. So there's something going on with the cone. So we kind of wanted to dig into this in a little bit more detail. Could it be that there's a reduction in cone number? And this is something that the Kefalov lab had reported that there was um, loss of M cones as well as M cone ops and mislocalization in global Rabi P1 knockout mouse mice. So we, we wanted to evaluate that in this study as well. So this was, um, um, these, are, these are retinal flat mounts um, stained with an M-cone opsin antibody and we're able to then count the number of cone outer segments in these flat mounts and quantify the density of cones. And that is shown here, the quantification of this. And um, confirming the work from, from Vladimir's lab, we did see a reduction in M cones in the global knockout mice compared to these other lines. We saw a statistically significant reduction. However, we didn't see any significant reductions between the groups, the control group and the RP <coughs> knockout, or the control group and the Muraglia knockout. Although I will note there was kind of a trend towards a lower, um, um, sorry, a, mu a lower number of M cones in the knockout in the RP knockouts, but it didn't reach statistical significance. So the cones generally look fine in, um, in terms of the cone number in these, in these cell-specific knockout lines. And we observe the same thing with the S cones. Okay, this is just the retinal flat mount stem with a stain with an um, anti-S cone oxygen antibody. So nothing really super notable there. We also wanted to look at the localization of <clears throat> the opsins, the um, M cone opsin and S cone opsin in these lines. So these are the anti M cone. These are um, retinal cryosection stained with anti M cone opsin antibody and anti S cone um, antibody. And these are the same panels. I've just subtracted away the, um, the DAPI signal to make it easier to visualize. So at the top row, these are, this is the result with global knockout 
mice. And so you can see the most of the M conopsin signal is in the outer segments as expected. But if you look close, let me see how visible it is on the screen. You can see some signal that's present in the inner segment and kind of around the nuclei as well as in the, um, um, the um, outer plexiform layer which is again consistent with what um, the Kepalov lab had, had observed with some level of imconopsin mislocalization. <clears throat> so we actually saw something similar in the RPE knockouts. Um, you can kind of see the same staining pattern with a little bit of low level staining in the inner segments as well as the outer plexiform layer that wasn't present in the control samples. Okay. Conversely, we didn't see any, any, anything um, notable in the, um, the s conopsin um, cryosections. So I'm just going to switch. I'm going to leave this top row the same. I'm going to switch the, the bottom two rows. And now we're looking at the Mueller glia knockout. And, and again, nothing notable here. There was, although you can see some staining, a little bit of staining in the outer plexiform layer, it's not the same degree of, of signal that we saw in the RPE knockouts. So what that means is I think that that desensitization could be um, could arise from a mislocalization of, of the, of the M-conopsin and possible also um, the phototransduction machinery, but um, it's something that I think needs to be explored further to, to completely iron out. Okay. Okay, so now um, we're kind of moving into studying what the impact of these cell-specific knockout is on visual chromophore recovery. <clears throat> and so the way that we did these mice, we would generate the cell-specific knockouts, dark adapt them, and then um, subject the mice to an intense photo bleach that would, um, that would um, bleach greater than 95% of their visual pigment and then put them back in the dark and allow them to dark adapt for various periods of times before we would euthanize the mice, take their eyes, and extract the retinoids to see what's to see um, to see what's happening with the retinoid composition. And the way we did that analysis was by HPLC. So these are HPLC chromatograms, and <laughs> you may not be super familiar with looking at these. So let me just kind of walk you through what these peaks mean. So if we start with the control. These are the control mice for the for the for the RP knockouts. <clears throat> we start out with um, this peak um, number one represents all trans retinal esters. Peak number two represents 11 cis retinal or technically 11 cis retinal oxime. And it, this is in the dark adapted state. So once these mice are exposed to those bright light and then immediately sacrificed and their eyes collected, what we see is um, and by the way, this bleaching is done over 10 minutes. So there's, a, there's an opportunity for some retinoid processing to happen during that time. You can see there's this really huge accumulation of all trans retinal esters. This is due to the retinoids moving from the, from the outer segments to the, to the retinal pigment epithelium. The 11 cis retinal is basically gone and you have some residual um, all trans retinal that's present that still hasn't been reduced and brought to the RPE. Okay. Now, after four hours, this reverts back to the dark adapted state. You can see that we've regenerated the 11 cis retinal, the retinal esters have gone down, and this really doesn't change much if you go all the way, to, all the way out to 48 hours. So that's sort of the, the baseline state. Now, what happens when we get rid of the CRVP in the retinal pigment epithelium? Um, the first thing to note here is that the baseline resting retinal ester storage is much lower in these mice. This was a very consistent finding. So this is suggesting that in some way CRBP might be um, involved in maintaining um, a little the excess, you know, sort of extra retinoid stores within within the um, ocular tissue. Um, so we do the bleach. You see the retinal esters um, build up. The alt, the eleven cis retinal is gone. And now the, here's where the big difference is. So it, by four hours in the control we had fully regenerated the 11 cis retinal, whereas in these RP knockouts, it's, it's hardly regenerated at all. It's maybe 10, 10 or 20% regenerated at this point. And it really takes all the way out to 48 hours. I'll show you time points in between in a second for this, for this 11 cis retinal to come back to the dark adapted level. So this is confirming that if we get rid of CRVP within the retinal pigment epithelium, there's a really pronounced delay 
in the recovery of 11 cis retinoid levels after a photo bleach. So now um, that I've explained all that, we can kind of more quickly look at the, the Muir glia um, data. Here's the control. Here's the Muir glia knockouts, um, dark adapted state, bleach, and then one hour and four hours. And you can tell just by comparing this trace to this trace that um, there's essentially no difference in the recovery of the 11 cis retinol between those two groups. So what this is telling us is that the, in terms of bulk visual chromophore recovery, um, the RPE pool of cellular retinaldehyde binding protein is playing the most important role. Um, I've quantified that here. Blue are controls, red are the knockouts. This is 11 cis retinal and dark adapted bleach and recovery. You can see in the controls, the 11 cis comes back very quickly, whereas it's very sluggish in the knockouts. And there's a corresponding delay in the clearance of all trans retinal esters after the photo bleach in these mice. <clears throat> Looking at the Mueller glia knockouts, you can see those curves basically fall on top of each other. So again, it's indicating that the, that the retinal pigment epithelium pool is the most important for bulk visual chromophore recovery. <clears throat> um, so I'll come back to this point in a second. So what this is actually indicating um, is that these RPE um, knockout mice have a delay at the isomerohydrolase step of the visual cycle. This is that step that's catalyzed by RP65, where it takes a retinal ester and converts it to 11 cis retinol. So the fact that you have a buildup of retinal esters and a delay in 11 cis retinol suggests that that step is the one that's delayed. <clears throat> uh, that step of the visual cycle is the one that's delayed. So an important thing then to evaluate is, well, does knocking out CRVP have an effect on RP65 expression? There could be, again, some regulatory compensatory changes that happen, but we were able to rule that out by Western body. We didn't see a significant difference in the um, RP expression between those two lines. So I'll come back to this point at the end and kind of give you my opinion on what the, how to interpret that data, but let's move on for now. So we, we actually really wanted to quantify how slow the, um, the regeneration rate was in these, those RP um, and the Mueller glia knockouts, although the Mueller glia actually weren't slowed. <clears throat> and you know, there's two approaches that have been used to evaluate this. The, there's an exponential model um, that, that models this recovery based on an exponential curve. And there's kind of this more complex rate limited model that was um, kind of first dis discussed by um, Lamb and Pew um, several years ago. That's kind of a more complicated looking um, equation and one that's not used very often, um, probably in part because it involves this function called the Lambert W function, which is not um, something that's present in a lot of um, 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 curve fitting programs like GraphPad, for example. So, <clears throat> um, but anyway, we had a lot of recovery data and this kind of gave us a, a kind of a chance to um, confirm or refute that this gives sort of a better fit to recovery data versus this exponential model. And this is just a result from that where we have our recovery data fit to the rate limited model <clears throat> versus um, an exponential model. These are least squares fits. And we can tell based on um, this criterion here, the Aka Ike um, information criterion, that we, we actually have a better fit to the, to the rate limiting model, even despite the fact that it's a more complex model. So kind of a, provide a nice confirmation um, that, uh, that, that, that that model um, is, is very relevant to this um, 11 cis retinal recovery. So then we can fit the, the data to, of the different mouse lines to this equation and derive Vmax values. So again, mu or glia control versus knockout. We don't see much of a difference in the Vmax values. However, whenever we control the RPE, compare the RPE control to the RP knockout, there's a, a major difference in the VMAX. And if you do the math, this turns out to be 15 fold slower visual chromophore regeneration in the RPE knockouts. And that's interesting that it turned out to be 15 fold because that's basically in line with what the SARI lab had reported for, um, for the global RPE knockout. I'm sorry, the global um, Robbie P1 knockout mice. So essentially, the, the um, similarity in those rates allows us to like assign that visual chromophore delay exclusively to the loss of CRVP within um, the retinal pigment epithelium in the global knockout mice. Okay, 
So now that you've seen this delay in visual chromophore recovery, it's not gonna surprise you at all that if we look at ERG recovery after a photo bleach, that it's massively delayed in the RPE knockouts compared to the corresponding controls. <clears throat> and we, so that's just confirming that there is a dark adaptation delay in these mice. And we were able to also evaluate the susceptibility of these different mouse lines to <clears throat> light-induced retinal degeneration. Again, um, the SARI lab had, had shown that um, these global CRBP knockout mice are protected from a chronic light um, exposure model. And what we did here was an acute um, damage model where the animals are exposed to um, bright light for, um, for a few hours and, and then allowed to, um, to go back to their home cage for, for a few days before they're evaluated by OCT and SLO imaging. And what you see here is in all cases, you, these animals are susceptible to light damage as evidenced by the loss of the outer nuclear layer, as well as the appearance of these white spots in the back of the eye by SLO imaging, except the RP knockouts. So they're perfectly fine and very protected from this light induced retinal degeneration. And again, that's attributable to their very slow visual cycle. <clears throat> Okay, so we kind of assessed the rod function very, um, very thoroughly, and now we wanted to move to see what the impact of cell-specific knockout of CRBP is on cone function. And again, this was work that was um, done in collaboration with the Keflov lab, um, <clears throat> where this is, so we can't actually study visual chromophore regeneration itself very easily in cones because it's such a small proportion of the photoreceptors in the mouse retina. So the way around this is to use ERG as a surrogate for that process. And again, if we're using the GNAT1 knockouts, we're able to specifically look at the ERG signals coming from the cone. So that's what this represents. We have dark adapted animals that are susceptible, um, subjected to a deep photo bleach. And then their ERG recovery is monitored over time with test flashes to see um, how their sensitivity is coming back as a function of time. So this is the RPE, by the way, so the, the graphs on the left are unnormalized data, the graphs on the right are normalized data, and we're comparing here the controls to the RPE knockouts. And what you can see from this graph is that there's a very marked slowing of the ERG, the M-cone ERG recovery um, as a function of time compared to the control animals. It's, it's reduced by, um, by over um, twofold in these mice, and it didn't matter whether or not we normalized the data or not. So <clears throat> this is really showing um, clearly that the cones are very dependent on the RPE for their visual chromophore supply, okay? <clears throat> Conversely, when we look at the Muir glia knockouts, those curves are superimposable, okay? So at least under this experimental paradigm, it, it appears that we, the RPE source of chromophore coming from CRBP is much more important compared to the, the, pool, the source that's coming from the Mueller glia. So this was a surprising result because I told you at the beginning, um, there's quite a bit of data to suggest that the Mueller glia CRBP is important for this process. Um, one of the, so one of the, um, pathways the CRBP can, can be engaged in is the RGR pathway. This is the photoregeneration pathway. And that gave us the idea uh, once we had, you know, considered that, that, that possibility that perhaps if we deliver the bleach over a different time scale, we might be able to engage that pathway and sort of reveal um, a role for CRBP in the regeneration process. So that's why we did this experiment. So instead of doing a step bleach, the light, the, the bleach was delivered over 60 minutes with a fairly bright source, 300 candela per meter squared. And again, the sensitivity is being continuously model, um, monitored during this period with test flashes. And then at the end of this hour, the lights turned off and the animals are allowed to recover in the dark. And again, their sensitivity is monitored with test flashes. And so under this paradigm, and particularly it becomes apparent whenever we look at the normalized data, um, normalized to the to the dark adapted sensitivity levels, that there is in fact a, um, an effect of knocking out CRBP in the Muir glia um, on the recovery, both both on the maintenance of sensitivity while the lights on, as well as during the recovery period of this curve. So <clears throat> this this um, 
suggest that maybe mu glia are important. The mu glia CRPP is important, but maybe only under specific um, light exposure conditions. So one of, one of the things that we had kind of speculated on in a, in a previous paper was that there could be um, one of the roles for the, for the mu glia CRPP could essentially be like a a, a bank account or for for eleven cis right now there could be enough just stored within the within the muir glia that it could act as a very rapidly mobilizable form of eleven cis right now to deliver cones um, during um, light exposure. So we kind of were in a position to test that um, because we had uh, um, some purified CRBP, very highly purified CRBP that we we're able to quantify um, by amino acid analysis. We had standards that we could use um, to do Western block quantification, absolute quantification of CRBP, both in the in the retina and the and in the RPE. Um, so that's what I'm showing you here are individual samples from mice. We we actually did this for two lines. This is showing the data for um, for Bob C or not. This is for um, C57 black six J mice. Um, this is isolated eye cups. These are isolated retinas. And here are our standards. And an important thing, if you're going to attempt to quantify the proteins by um, immunoblotting, it's important to recognize that it matters whether um, that you put these proteins, standard proteins in the matrix, um, in the same matrix that your experimental samples would be in. So the way we did that, fortunately, Vladimir had, um, again, RAPP1 knockout mice. So we're able to prepare retinal and RPE or ICUP homogenates and then put our standards within those homogenates so we could account for any sort of matrix effects that could arise um, during this Western body procedure. And it was an issue. It did change things. So it was important to include that. So what I'm just showing you here is that our, as our samples are um, at a low range, we're in the linear range of these curves um, in, for both the black six mice as well as the bulb CJ mice in isolated eye cups, isolated retina. And from that, we were able to um, quantify the levels of the CRBP in those two cell types. And so the result, what we got here is um, <clears throat> about one and a half or so picomoles per eye of CRBP in the eye cups and about 2.5 or so picograms, sorry, pico, picomoles per eye in the retina. So this gives us a one to two ratio of CRBP in the RPE and the neural retina. So that's actually very similar to what was obtained from um, what was reported by Jack Sari's group um, whenever they looked at the ratio in the bovine eye. But what we found is there's, whenever you normalize um, these quantities to the amount of rhodopsin that's present, there's about 20 times less CRBP in the mouse eye compared to the bovine eye. And so if you then um, do a calculation to find out how, how much conopsin is present in the mouse eye, you find that there's only about 0.35 moles of CRBP per mole of conopsin in the eye. So this really, um, I think, goes against what we were originally thinking, um, that there's a lot of CRBP with 11 cis retinol or 11 cis retinol sitting there ready to deliver it to the cones. And that might be why we didn't really see much of an effect of knocking out CRBP um, in the muir glia under the <laughs> step bleach paradigm that I showed you. Okay, so this is kind of just summarizing the phenotypes and you can see, you know, these are the phenotypes that, that were observed in global RABP1 knockout mice and based off of our data, we're able to assign those to now the cellular pool. And what you can see is that for the most part, um, it, th these phenotypes are due to loss of CRBP in the retinal pigment epithelium, um, with the exception of delayed cone dark adaptation, where we could see a role for the muir glia um, pool after an extended bleaching exposure. Okay, so that brings me to the kind of, I think, possible translational value of this study. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there are gene therapies under development for treating RABP1 associated retinopathies. And <clears throat> I, I think that our data, uh, um, a case that really the RPE um, for sure should not be ignored. It, it's it's a, an important supplement to target with these gene therapies. And really, I believe it's the one that should be prioritized. <clears throat> okay. Um, this is, I'm kind of speculating now. How am I doing some time? 
Um, I want to come back to um, this issue of slowed all trans retinal ester processing in Robbie P1 knockout mice. So this was previously interpreted to mean that CRVP is acting immediately downstream of RP65 to take 11 cis retinol out and then deliver it to RDH5, the next enzyme in the pathway. Okay, and this is, I think most people, if you read papers, um, really tend to think this. Um, however, our, and again, our data doesn't, address this, but I just, I'm just, this is just for what it's worth since I have the four, we'll say it. Um, one thing we know now from structural studies and cross-linking studies is that RT65 and RDH5 are both membrane bound proteins. So their active sites are both embedded in the membrane. And it's also known that these proteins interact closely. That was actually one of the first things that was discovered about RT65 is that it co-purifies with RDH5. So based off of this, I would argue that there's no need for a retinoid carrier to bring retinoid from RP65 to RDH5. I think it's much simpler to assume that the product comes out and it's immediately able to go to the next enzyme through the membrane. Okay, so it's just my two cents. And then after it's processed by RDH5, it goes to CRVP, which brings it back to the outer segment. So in this case, whenever you knock out CRVP, um, what's happening, you don't have this acceptor to sort of drive the reaction and these products can back up and it's known, for example, that RP65 is, um, is susceptible to product inhibition. And that's probably why once you knock this out, you have product inhibition here. So this step is blocked and that's what leads to the accumulation of, of all trans retinal esters. Um, the other thing I want to address is kind of reconciling the, the sort of more limited role for Mueller glia CRVP in photo, photoreceptor function with past studies. So um, to say, first of all, our, our findings are consistent with the most recent studies in um, knockout zebrafish, <clears throat> which showed, also like we showed, a dominant role for RP, um, CRVP in photoreceptor function. <clears throat> um, in prior mouse studies implicating Muir glia, CRVP, um, in cone function, they relied heavily on ex vivo experiments where the RP was absent, so it was difficult to compare the relative importance um, of the Muir glia to the RPE. And it, this was done with viral expression. So, I mean, where, whereas it was clearly shown that the, the viral targeting was good, the absolute level of expression wasn't well quantified. And so it was difficult to know whether, how much protein was being expressed and whether possible um, um, high level expression in the Muir glia, for example, could compensate or lead to a sort of a super physiologic effect. <clears throat> um, another possibility is again, those previous studies are starting at a different point than what we've done because um, they had the protein knocked out um, in the germline. So that could potentially alter the retina to become more reliant on Muir cell pathways. <clears throat> Um, this is not really a reconciliation, but more of just an acknowledgement of a limitation of the study that we are using a rod dominant um, model for these studies. And it's fully possible that cone rich retinas or cone rich retinal regions could be more dependent on Muir glia CLVP for visual chromophore delivery. We're not able to assess that. Okay. Um, kind of the last thing is. It's possible also that the Muir glia CRVP could be doing something entirely different, not involved in photoreceptor function or additional to its involvement in photoreceptor function is the possible support of melanopsin function in the IPRGCs. <clears throat> if you look at this, these cross sections showing CRVP staining, it's in the RPE, it's in the neural retina. And if you look in the neural retina, actually the strongest area of, of staining is, is within the in feed of the Muir glia in close proximity to the ganglion cell layer. And we know there's melanopsin there in these IPRGCs. So it could be that it's important for delivering chromophore to melanopsin. And actually there's some data on this already from um, Kuhn Wong's lab, where they had showed that in the RP, uh, sorry, um, Robby P1 knockout mice, that there's a, um, um, <clears throat> the defect in prolonged, um, pupillary responses to light. If you look at the controls, their pupils remain constricted over this period of time, whereas in the knockouts, they constrict, but then that wears off over time, potentially suggesting that the melanopsin signaling is fading away whenever you don't have an, enough visual chromophore supply. Okay, so um, I have a lot of people to thank for making 
the study um, a success. I want to start with Marco Bassetto, who's a postdoc in the lab, who kind of took this project midway through and really drove it to completion. So kudos to Marco for, for doing that and for all the great work you did. Dominique Lewandowski um, did critical work on helping us quantify cone cells. Um, Janine Kaiser for expert retinal dissections. Um, Max Alabi is a very talented medical student. He just graduated and he did a lot of the immunohistochemistry I showed you. Um, Elliot Choi for help with the mouse um, design and then David Einstein for doing a lot of the initial work in breeding mice and preparing the lines. Um, big thanks to the Kefalov lab for their um, super critical contribution to the ERG studies. And uh, special thanks to Chris Palczewski. This was a experiment that we that talk, talked about many years ago uh, and designed the lines. And I, I hope you're as happy as I am to see the, the project come to, uh, to fruition and get good results from it. I'd also like to thank Jack Sari for providing us with um, CRVP antibody, which is critical for this study. And of course, nothing gets done without funding. I just want to thank the Department of Veterans Affairs for long time support and <clears throat> particularly um, RPB. Um, they, they awarded me a, a career development award, sorry, career advancement award, um, specifically to look at some of these unresolved features of CRVP. So I really appreciate that. And um, the National Eye Institute. So thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. So I will start with a quick question before we go to uh, Zoom and uh, in the room. When you separate retina and RPE, in retina you had a single band of CRLBP. In RPE, you have, CRLBP appears as a dimer. Do you know molecular differences between yeah. those forms? Thank you for asking that. Let me go back to that. So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so the the finding that Dr. Balcheski is referring to, I think, is here. This doublet band um, for CRBP that we see in um, the eye cup samples, not in the neural retina. Um, so we had attributed this to potential proteolysis, even though we had protease inhibitors here, it had been described before that the CRBP is um, susceptible to proteolysis. So we just chalked it up to that. But there's actually was a paper that was posted to BioArchive maybe about a month ago, um, where they were able to show that actually CRBP has two start codons that are used and actually that this lower form represents uh, a later start codon. So it's actually two sort of different isoforms. Um, we didn't really go into this in a lot of detail. I will note that if you look in the Bob C mice that you don't see this doublet band um, in the in the eye cups. So actually once I got this result, I kind of became less interested because it didn't it looked like it might be something that's specific to the to the black six line, but um, it is interesting that somebody was able to sort that out, and it looks like it is just two, two different sort of isoforms. Yeah. Really great talk, Phil. Thank you so much. Um, in the uh, when you started to dissect the molecular contribution of CRIPP activity, did you do you think that if you did not bleach, the, if when you did the bleaching step, if you had a filter to exclude green lights and not include RGR activation, yeah. that you'd actually see an even larger effect? That's a that's an interesting um, experiment to do. We didn't do it. Um, I actually would think that if we excluded, essentially, if we could find a way to exclude our, the RGR pathway by some filtering, you know, filtering out light, um, I think that if 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 we're right, if what I'm saying is right, I think that the effect of knocking out the the CRBP would be less pronounced because. Um, you know, my my vision of this is that CRBP is playing a role in facilitating the RGR pathway. So if you would take that out of the system, then you wouldn't see that difference. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Kaiser, great talk, thank you. Uh, can you please elaborate further on the crosstalk between pulse of CRBP from RPE and Miller glia on supporting of cone cell dark adaptation? Yes. So, you know, our, um, <clears throat> as far as crosstalk, um, we, we 
we did it by knocking out CRVP in one cell, we didn't see any compensation in the other. So that, that was um, one thing that we were able to rule out was happening. Um, so my th thinking is that, um, that the ret that, so I believe that the retinoids, most, some, at least part of the retinoids that are present in the Mueller glia actually arise from, from the RPE. I think that that's how they, they get there. I think they're produced and they're, they're probably trafficked into the, to the Mueller, to the Mueller glia. Um, so I do think there's a crosstalk there. And, and the reason I say that is because, you know, there, we always have to come back to this fact that if you get rid of our, if you knock out RP65, none of these systems work. So it's, it's, it's like things have to be right in the RPE before any, before any of these other systems can be engaged. So I do think that there's a crosstalk and kind of um, retinoids that ar originate from the RPE that make it to the Muir glia. Um, that's my thinking on it. Hopefully I answer your question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right, let's go to uh, Zoom and Greg. Hey, Philip. Um, it, I thought that this was a really beautiful approach to answer a really complicated question. Um, what my what my question is about deals with the um, retinal esters that are in the dark adapted um, RPE knockout, and so you you have that diminished retinal ester content and the dark adapted mice. I was just curious if you 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 mentioned you said one thing really quick about it. Could you kind of expand a little bit on your thoughts about why it is that you're getting um, diminished retinal esters in those knockouts? Sure. Yeah. So um, Dr. Talk, talk Traps referring to this. Um, so again, these are the same, you know, same line. It's just one has been tre treated with tamoxifen and one not. And um, what you can see is, you know, and I, I point that out because there are differences in the levels of retinal ester accumulation in different strains of mice. So I just wanted to say this is the exact same strain of a mouse. So it's not due to that. Um, the, this is just an idea. Um, if my thinking is, if you don't have CRVP present to kind of, um, you know, these retinoids probably are not just floating around free very long. Um, and that it's really important for CRVP to be present to keep the retinoid bound and get it to where it needs to go. And if you, my thinking is if you get rid of CRVP, there might be some sort of off pathway um, transport reactions that happen and it could make say these retinoids susceptible to reverse transport out of the RPE through, through straw six. So it's just, it's just an idea. Um, I will point out there was um, a nice study by um, Stephen Sang and Jer Janet Sparrow back in 2020, where they also looked at, um, um, they, were, they were studying Rob P1 global knockout mice and they actually had the same finding that in those knockout mice, you, you had a reduced level of retinal ester. So that's my thinking. It, it may just be, you need, all these binding proteins are really important for, um, for maintaining the stores of the vitamin A within the retinal pigment epithelium in one way or another. So I guess one one comment on that is it is it and then I'll shut up is that um, is it possible you know you you drew, you drew the um, LRAT to RP sixty five to RDH as like a complex is it possible that maybe like the straw six that that is even a bigger superstructure that could involve also straw six and that you know losing your CRL CRALBP just breaks up these larger superstructures. Um, it's it's possible. Um, I don't know the Stra six forms a complex. I mean, the the, the, the Stra six is localized to the plasma membrane, and all of those other proteins are in the endoplasmic reticulum, and it's not really not really observed. Like if you look at RP sixty five staining and, and Stra six staining, you know that Stra six is is you know basically restricted to the basal side of the RPE, and the other enzymes are sort of within the cell body. So I don't know that it's in a physical interaction between those, but I think it's a functional interaction for sure. And that um, if you disrupt that, the retinoid by one way or another can diffuse out and be susceptible to reverse um, export out of the RPE. But again, it's just me speculating. Hold on, let's move to uh, Professor Jim. Oh, thank, yeah, thanks. It was a really great talk. Um, I did a question. So do you see, um, like after the really long, or really a, a full bleach, 
and you wait four hours and you see accumulation of the retinal esters. Do you, it, have you done anything that would show whether there's an expansion of the retinosomes? Great question. Thank you, Dr. Hurley, for that. Um, I would assume that during this bleach, you know, whenever you have the accumulation of these retinal esters, that they are um, going into retinosomes. We 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 know that um, from in Grajna. Maybe you can help with this or something. But yeah, um, that they are going into the retinosomes. They go into <clears throat> they go into retinosome stores, and they're slowly kind of taken out of that and processed by by RP sixty five. But to answer your question directly, we didn't look at that. We didn't see exactly um, whether those are retinal esters that are embedded, say, in, a, in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane or whether they're, it's, we can actually observe retinosomes increasing. If I may comment, you remember, Jim, maybe in JCB, Imanishi showed that increase in retinosomes after bleach? Uh, I'll check it out. The, the but, original uh, retinosome paper. Okay, but a related question was, I wrote down the slide uh, 33, um, slide 33, where I think it was the ERGs of the, um, of, of the cone responses. Uh, is that right? Uh, yeah, so the, the cone responses are diminished. This is B waves, right? Um, yeah, yes. Yeah. Or sense, yeah. And the cone response rate, I, I'm just wondering whether the, um, uh, the, the, all the, the retinoids in the whole system are sort of trapped in the, uh, in the retinal esters. And so maybe the cones are just deprived of, of retinoids, not because of any direct interaction, but mo more because the, uh, the overall system is trapping them, the retinoids and retinal esters in the RPEs. Is, is that a possible interpretation? Yeah, I, th I think so. So in other words, you know, you wouldn't normally have these free and they could, it, um, yeah, one way or the other, they're trapped. That's exactly right. I mean, that's, 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 and, and because they're trapped there, um, the RPE is not able to synthesize the 11 cis retinalis, retinalis fast and possibly the other systems wouldn't be able to synthesize right. this either. It's sort of like right. vitamin A deprivation kind of, yeah. Yes, exactly. So um, as far as the, just one quick thing here, as far as this residual, I mean, we know, again, this is work we, that we did with Vladimir, that there are, there is a shunt, like, so there is a possible, you know, it's possible to get 11 cis right now um, produced by the, the visual cycle enzymes and then um, exported to the outer segment. It's just an inefficient process. And we know that if you, if you further, if, so if you take CRBP knockout mice, and further suppress things by blocking the visual cycle with an inhibitor that results in even a more dramatic reduction um, and almost like the cones don't really recover much at all under those circumstances. So, thanks for the question. Thanks. Michael. Mike Redmond. Hi, yeah, I'm here. Great talk as usual. Um, congratulations. Um, I, I just have a, sort of a comment and uh, and a question. It, it seems that um, what you're showing is that there is, with you know, taking all your data, that there is a real species-specific um, uh, uh, relevance here, that if you're uh, um, a, a cone-dominant versus uh, rod-dominant, and I guess mouse is... Um, uh, the extreme example of raw dominant um, uh, compared to uh, primates, which have uh, phobia. But uh, then my uh, question is uh, with respect to um, some of the old work of, um, of Jack Sari, uh, a paper from the uh, 80s, I think it was, uh, Sari and Bradberg where they um, um, uh, address um, uh, the role, potential role of Kraub uh, as a branch point. So um, diverting 11 um, uh, uh, cis uh, retinol either towards um, uh, storage, towards LRAT uh, and it's can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me okay? Well, I mean, we can hear you very well. 
I think there's some interference on the line. But anyway, um, uh, it acts as a branch point, either diverting towards the uh, uh, retinosomes potentially, or towards the uh, towards the uh, photoreceptors. Uh, is is it possible to um, address uh, that in your model? Yeah, thank you, Mike, for that um, question. It's uh, it's an interesting point. So yeah, th those were some really interesting studies that they did. Um, you know, they were all in vitro, and I think that you know you have to be a little bit careful how to um, interpret those because you know a lot of those reactions they were studying, or some of them at least, um, clearly are not physiologically relevant. I mean, you don't see these coming, you know, showing up whenever you say you knock out um, these type of products, abnormal products that would accumulate in in the, the CRBP um, <clears throat> knockout mice. So, um, you know, I think that to, um, I'm just trying to think of, you know, I think that the in vivo work is kind of there. I mean, we know what's forming whenever you don't have CRBP present. And I think some of that branch point, I mean, I've definitely read those studies and I, I just, um, I just don't know how well really they agree with what's seen in the in vivo situation. It's just such a different thing whenever you have all the, the components around. So, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting and it's something, you know, I always keep in mind whenever I'm thinking about these experiments, but <clears throat> um, I just kind of question how relevant those, those were given what we now know about where CRBP is working with individual cycle. So. Thanks. Hi, Phil. Um, the, it was fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. One, one question that's more like a comment, and you already answered it, that it may be in the cone which retinas there is a difference. Uh, the Muller glia component is more important. Actually, it's probably true because cone RP ratio, ratio in fovea is like 50 to 1, while Muller glia to, co to cones is like one on one almost. Mm -hmm. So there is possibility. Uh, probably it's interesting to study. I have two questions. One is the is there any Kral BP outside of like in co choroid, for example? And the second question is uh, what is the transport mechanism between? Uh, by through the membrane between CRAL-BP, IRBP, and then, yeah. and is it specific for cones or not? Right, okay, so thanks for those questions. To, to address the first one, it's not in the choroid. Um, whenever we take an eye cup, we can be sure that we're looking just at the retinal pigment epithelium. It is expressed in other areas of the body. I mean, there's reports of it being expressed in the pineal gland, for example, and some other some other places in the brain, so that's kind of something that hasn't been studied at all, like exactly what's going on, although there's some reports of it being involved in various behaviors and things. Um, so yeah, so then the second question concerning transport. Um, so it's thought, you know, that CRBP is, is accepting 11 cis right now from the visual cycle from basically from RDH5, and then it has to get it from the ER to the apical microvilli. Um, which are surrounding both rods and cones. So I don't think there's really any difference there. But the, the question is, what's driving that process? And again, if you go back and look in the literature, Jack Sari um, and John Crabb and others have um, did a series of studies where they're able to show that CRBP is um, interacting with ezrin binding proteins that are enriched in the, ap in the apical microvilli of the RPE. And that's po a possible mechanism that drives it to those areas where it then interacts with the membrane to release the chromophore. So there's definitely a process of it going to those apical microvilli <clears throat> and there's some trigger. Um, it may be acidic phospholipids. That's one of the, of the um, factors that have been shown to promote release of, of 11 cis right now from CRVP. Um, so you have this driving to the apical microvilli interaction with the phospholipid and then you have the dumping of the, of the retinol into the membrane where it diffuse probably binds to IRVP and then eventually makes it into the other segments to regenerate the opsin. So there's a lot to sort out there. And actually we have some, some studies going on to address that, but they're, they're very um, in their infancy at this time. But yeah, lots to learn there. Yeah. Hi. Oh, Philip, a oh, very nice and a thorough talk. You. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, nice to see you again. <laughs> Um, so I have a question. You have mentioned that uh, 
there are some like uh, therapeutic uh, efforts surrounding this uh, CRALBP, right? right? Um, I'm just wondering, so what's the population of this? The, do you have any like a report about the patient have the deficiency in this uh, um, protein? And uh, what's the population is like? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's certainly a very rare disease. Uh, it's, I, it's, it's rarer than Stargardt disease for sure. So it's one of these rare forms of, you know, like retinitis pigmentosa. Um, so yeah, the market's not huge. It's definitely like an orphan disease. Um, but um, the current gene, uh, there's either one or two that for sure Novartis has a program where they're developing um, um, a gene therapy for this type of um, retinal disease. I think it's in progress. I think there may, they may have shown some results about this recently, but um, yeah, it's not going to be, um, this is not going to be a blockbuster drug. It's, it's going to be for a very limited population, but you know, um, it's still something where, again, if the cost, if the production costs can be lowered, you know, it's something hopefully <clears throat> that um, is still worthwhile. It can still benefit um, actually quite a, you know, a large number of patients, a large number of patients, relatively speaking. I mean, the disease is rare, right? Unless you have it, right? And then it's the most important thing in the world. So um, I don't think that's a reason to not develop, you know, therapies. Okay. So yeah. uh, is there any like a small molecule or other like uh, um, uh, mRNA type of things? So not that I'm aware of right now. I'm sure that certainly there's the potential to do other things like genome editing and things of that nature to correct this as well. But um, the main the main therapeutic that I'm aware of is just the, the, the AAB based gene therapy that's under development. Yeah. Thank you. Hello again. Um, very interesting talk, and it had me thinking. We're talking a lot about like the genetic causes behind this, but right beneath us, one floor beneath us is dermatology and they prescribe isotretinoin and it's known to interfere with the retinoid pathways all around the body. And I was thinking, um, say if you had a patient on this or which may not be, um, they may ex express some dark issues with dark adaptation. And I was wondering if you did similar experiments, you would see similar responses as some of these mice that you had. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, isotretinoin is was the, that was really the, the, the first visual cycle modulator that was sort of studied. I mean, it had been known for a long time that, you know, retinoic acid can cause um, delayed dark adaptation. That was a side effect from those, from those drugs. And that was actually first used by Paul Sevin and um, Roxana Radu. They did a study where they treated mice with that and showed, yeah, it delays dark adaptation, actually protects against the light damage. So Absolutely. The, those, those, those like retinoic acid and then the series of visual cycle modulators really would do a very similar thing to what we're seeing with the CRBP knockout in the sense that they would you know, really dramatically slow the rate of recovery after the light explosion of the recovery of the right now. So yeah, I would absolutely expect um, a lot of these phenotypes to be recapitulated whenever those drugs are used. Yeah. So following on uh, Ninka question, in Finland, in the botany, this is the bay, uh, there should be a prevalence of that disease relatively high compared yeah. to, do you know the numbers? I don't, I don't know the number. Um, yeah, right. So in, in Finland, that's one of the Bothnia dystrophy um, where they, they actually have a, the, the mutation is kind of interesting. So it's a um, arginine 234 to tryptophan substitution that actually enhances the affinity of CRBP for, for 11 cis retinol. So it actually, it, going, going back to what Dorota asked about, it's, a, it's actually an issue with releasing it once it's bound. Um, so it's an interesting disease uh, and certainly localized to that area, probably due to just sort of you know, inbreeding type, or not really inbreeding, but just sort of a limited population that tends to stay in one place. I don't have the problem, sorry. Okay. Well, I have my opinion about your presentation, but uh, just asking audience randomly, what do you think about the seminar? Wonderful seminar. With that, thank you very much.